Well, welcome everybody to Ember Coom online tonight. Thank you all for coming. Um, it feels quite exciting because this is the first talk of our winter season. So um, we're feeling a little bit rusty, so you'll have to bear with us. Uh, and it's uh, great to see so many people. I think that's probably because we have an excellent speaker with us tonight, Philip Shepherd, all the way from Canada. Hi, Philip. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Um, just for all those of you who don't know, we are um, an organisation called Ember Coombe. We are based in Devon in England and uh, we run courses, events, um, online events and residential. And our exploration is really about how, as human beings, we can become in better balance with the more than human world in everything that we do, the food we eat, uh, the way we are, um, how we communicate with each other. So it's very much how we can find belonging in the world. And we're super excited to have Philip here with us tonight because it feels that his work is really so resonant uh, with what we're trying to do. His work really is about how we can use our bodies to come back into connection and relationship and belonging um, with the wider world. So Philip uh, is a, I'm sure many of you will know his work, he is an embodiment um, leader, I would say an a global leader of embodiment. Um, he's got two fabulous books, Radical Wholeness and New Self, New World. He has a book about to come out in five days, which I'm hoping he's going to tell us a little bit about later, called Deep Fitness. That's right, isn't it, Philip? Deep Fitness. Um, and he's also the creator of the Embodied present process which he will talk a little bit about tonight as well so philip hello fabulous to have you uh, that's my bit over also just to say to everybody we've only got an hour so we will cram in as much as we can i will talk to philip um, for a little bit first we will then open up for questions um, after about 20 to 30 minutes uh, philip is going to be giving us a little exercise at the end um, what I would say is um, you're welcome to put questions in the chat as we go along. Cindy, Nusha and I will look at those. And when question time comes, we'll also ask those of you who want to, to stick your hands up or put questions in the chat and we'll just get as many questions answered as we can from Philip. So Philip, over to you. Um, I would love really to start our conversation very general. We'll come to embodiment specifically later, but very generally. Um, why do you think it's important for us to see ourselves as part of nature at this time in our very uncertain world? Yeah, that, I think that steers me straight into embodiment. So it, there's no dodging it from my point of view. Um, I, you know, I loved what you said about, about recognizing how deeply we belong to the world, how we are born of it, sustained through it. Um, you know, it's just, it, it is our reality and it's a reality that we have contracted from. And that contraction isn't a recent thing. It, it began with the Neolithic revolution. Um, so, you know, imagine the Neolithic revolution, of course, is where we discovered agriculture and we built permanent settlements and we, domesticated animals but imagine that first moment when someone gathers seed and and pushes it into the ground and pats it down with that gesture the whole schema of the world has shifted on its axis because suddenly this bit of ground is now mine because my seed is there and suddenly the the little plant growing up beside my seed is a weed and until that moment, there was no such thing as a weed. There was just the bounty of, of the goddess. And, you know, the animal coming along is now vermin because it might eat my little plant. And the tree growing beside my plant has to be cut down because it's putting my plant in shade. And, and you know, when, I, when my domesticated animals have um, 
animals of their own when they breed those young animals are my possession are, are you know impecunious which means you know to have no money comes from an indo-european root that means you're without cattle and our relationship with those animals is a mirror image of our um dogma reinforced relationship with the god in the sky who you know we determine the moment of death of our domesticated animals when we butcher them we determine with whom they'll breed we have control over them as we wish to assert control over nature as we imagine this deity is is asserting control over us so it's a it's a large large story that has led us to contract and contract and contract into a state of feeling alone and you know the very proposition that we are alone um is is untenable all there is in this world in this reality is wholeness the the universe feels your every gesture your every thought you are informed by the currents of the present at every moment they're coursing through your being and so we we contract into this idea that we're alone it's like we're taking a, taken as little seedlings and stuck into this pot of aloneness and told to grow there and as soon as we buy into this cultural message that we are alone there, there's it's like a domino effect because now my experience is strictly private it doesn't affect the world the world is buffered against affecting it so i've got this private experience inside my skin and my number one job becomes to organize that experience to make it feel good to to sustain it to win at it to whatever to get it right and so that places us in self-consciousness we are you know divided between the supervisor in the head and this this life that needs to be organized just as we've organized our our farming and our animals and it's as though we've taken the spotlight of our attention and turned it off the world and put it on the self so it's extraordinary that we spend so many waking hours of our day thinking about our thoughts and it's this it's this this self-absorption that to us feels natural we've habituated to it but we are imprisoned in in this paradigm of self-consciousness because we are living in the head and i mean we are of nature we belong to nature uh, um we, we we we've so contracted that we feel to connect with our deepest truth is a matter of sort of dropping down inside and and finding the truth within yourself and i think that idea is part of our contraction it's part of our self-consciousness you know even the idea of how important it is to know who you are is part of that contraction we assemble this construct of this is me and then then we have to defend that construct. Um, I, who I am, I discover who I am as I come into felt relationship with the world around me. You know, as I stand before a tree and feel its presence, I'm illuminated in a particular way. As I listen to bird song, I am illuminated by it. As I, as I feel the waves washing up on the shore, I'm illuminated in a particular way by that. The more deeply I come into felt relationship with the world around me, and especially with nature, the more clearly I discover who I am, not, not in a silo, but in relationship. Mm. 
And so what, what, so presumably before the Neolithic revolution then, our bodies were our kind of way of, commun or they were one important way of communicating and being in relationship with the world around us. How on earth did that contraction happen then? You know, did, did yeah, yeah. That's well, incredible. okay, here's, here's what seems um, sort of, uh, almost impossible to our culture. In the early Neolithic, we experienced our thinking in the belly, just as they do in Japan, just as they do in the jungles of Brazil, just as they do in the Philippines. And as we began to take control of the world, three things happened simultaneously. One is our allegiance withdrew from the earth beneath our feet and, and attached itself to the sky. And that shows up in our, in our iconography. And I mean, where is hell? Well, it's below our feet. Where is heaven? Oh, heaven is above us. We have demonized the very earth. The other thing that happened is, is in the late Paleolithic, early Neolithic, we were gathered around the mother. We were, we, we were a matrifocal culture. You know, the figurines that survived from 30, 40,000 years ago are of women. And that was the center. I mean, how could it not be? And yet, as we took charge of the world around us, we shifted our allegiance to the father. The father became the head, the center of, of our culture. And the third thing that happened is that the center of our awareness began to rise out of the pelvic bowl up to the chest and finally up to the head. So if you go back to the original texts of Homer, there's a word he uses over and over, phrenes, P-H-R-E-N, and it's sometimes singular, sometimes plural, it means mind and it means diaphragm. That is where they experience their thinking. It's not that they're, they got their anatomy wrong. Um, and, and Richmond Lattimore actually preserves that sense. He's my favorite translator of Homer. You know, he'll have a character say, the mind within my breast understands your words. And then by Homer's day, uh, no, sorry, by Plato's day, so 350 BC, we are in our heads. And he's got a, one of his dialogues is called Timaeus. And this very brilliant man uh, uh, is asked, how did the gods create us? And he answers, well, first they fashioned this divine orb based on the spheres of the heavens. And then they realized this divine orb would have difficulty getting around. So they grew it a vehicle, arms and legs and a trunk. So there we are 350 BC and we have colonized our own bodies. We have detached from the female and denigrated it and exalted the male. And I really feel within my body that cranial intelligence as the male pole of my consciousness. It systematizes, it gains perspective, it analyzes, it organizes. And all of that is wonderful but it is meant to work in concert with that intelligence deep in the pelvic bowl. And I feel that intelligence as the female pole of my consciousness and it attunes to the world and it integrates. I mean, the, the cranium knows nothing of integration. It analyzes, it pulls things into their component pieces, but that intelligence in the pelvic bowl gathers and feels and integrates and that is what we have exiled ourselves from so where does that leave us now then so most of us are up here with our cranial intelligence mm -hmm. another form of intelligence is kind of happening without us I'm saying, without us noticing actually for a lot of people i'm sure they do notice it but where where are we now well it's it, here's what I think the nub of of the understanding can rest on 
is that we are in every moment of our lives held in the wholeness of the present, in the wholeness of the earth, in the wholeness of the universe, a wholeness that cannot be divided, it cannot be escaped. And so the challenge isn't to regain our wholeness. How can you, how can you leave it? How can you lose it? The challenge is to recognize that what has happened layer by layer is that our culture has desensitized us to wholeness. We have been rendered blind to it. We no longer feel it. So, you know, you, you need to go on a retreat for seven days to begin to feel the present as a whole. Well, if you're not feeling the wholeness of the present, you're not feeling the present. That is its reality. And to begin to understand how those desensitivities live as shadows in the body and little patterns in the body. I always find it interesting that the word pattern comes from the Latin pater, father. There's that male organizing influence in charge of our fluid, sensitized life. And, and, and we, um, we are confined in ways that we are unaware of because those patterns permeated our being before we were old enough even to formulate a question. We just take it on. Any culture is, is a story. It represents a story of what it means to be human. And every, every distinct culture represents a distinct cult, uh, idea or story of what it means to be human. And I think the initiation rites that our culture has forsaken are primarily about leaving the crucible of that story and encountering reality itself and learning that, yes, the story has value, but no story can contain reality. So your work then, to bring it back to your work then, so what would you say your aim is with your work to bring back wholeness, bring back people's ability to recognize and be in wholeness? So. It's, the embodied present, let's start there then, because I, okay. I think there's a, I love this mm -hmm. idea of the present and wildness and both of those things seem connected. And maybe, so maybe you could talk around that a bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, uh, I was thinking about the present, that it's such a big thing for me. I mean, it's, it's all there is, so why not think about it? And I, I was trying to figure out what is the nature, what is the nature of the present? And the closest I could come was that the, the nature of the present is a wild peace. The present and nature itself, you can substitute nature. Nature is always at peace. Nature is always wild. It, it is, it's not a contradiction. It's a marriage of complementary opposites. And so if I'm to be true to my own nature, I need to find the peace that will enable the wildness. I need to express the wildness through which I can find my peace. And the embodied present, I'm so glad, many people uh, call it the embodied presence process. And that's not, that's not it at all. The embodied present, what I'm trying to point to with that, with that name is that it's not that I'm in here and the present is out there. The present lives through me, is me at every moment, to the extent that if I'm living in my head and I see a tree out my window, it's very clear that it's there and I'm here. If I feel the presence of the tree from my body, from that center in the pelvic bowl, it is living within me, even as it lives there outside my window. I feel every particular of the present coursing through my being. So there's a culture in Africa, the Anglo Ewe, who have a completely different 
concept of what the human senses are and what they have. They don't really have a word for senses. They have a word, sesilalame, that means feel, feel at flesh inside. And everything in the world, they feel through their flesh. So, for instance, they have a word that means, you know, to listen from the ear, but that, that's not real listening until you feel the sounds of the world around you through your body you're not really hearing them until you feel the sights of the world in your body you're not hearing them and that brings up the question of well what is you know what is what is the body i mean metaphorically you know, metaphorically what what is the most useful metaphor we could find for the body and for me I experience and think of my body as a resonator. Um, so, um, so here, it, it's, you know, the body is like a singing bowl. And the singing bowl, it's empty inside. And it's that emptiness that allows it to ring. And my body rings to the present when I have when I have unburdened it of those shadows of desensitivity. And what happens in our culture is that singing bowl gets stuffed full of anxieties and trauma and unintegrated ideas and agendas and worries. And so the present is all the time going like this, but, but we don't feel it. And when that's happening, when we're, we've, we've so dulled ourselves, to the present that we can't feel it, then that reinforces our need to live in the head because there is no tangible, intimate, personal present to guide me. And when there is not that guidance available, all I can do is guide myself. All I can do is take charge from the head and sort out what is best. So, so my approach to body work is really to find those shadows those consolidations and integrate them and release them so that once again the body can ring to the present and every single exercise that i've developed targets a specific mode of desensitivity to which we've all been subjected and I, I mean, I have over a hundred exercises, a hundred practices that I've developed and, and there are more to come because, because it's been thousands of years over which these desensitivities have heightened our sense of hubris and domination and control over what after all is, is the very life that sustains us. I'm really interested, um, very specifically, I, I, I read a beautiful description you, you made in writing actually of the bowl, I think you said it was a bell. And we're like a bell and we have space within us, but it's the same space as the world outside us as well. And how those two spaces are exactly the same and they kind of one resonates with the other. And I. I just thought that was such a beautiful way of thinking and you know we've just got the skin but actually we've got the same space within us if that's what you meant I'm not sure but that's how I read it and when I'm kind of thinking about this connection to the to nature to the world to um all that is yeah it, it, it's like how do we do that it should be so damn easy you're saying you have lots of exercises for it do we have to spend our life going through exercises trying to reach that kind of resonance and emptiness and feeling of, of other within us what what what's the fast track or what's the process what are you suggesting people do <clears throat> sorry here about 20 questions they're all in yeah one. no no i'm <sighs> 
I mean, so many things come up for me uh, as you were talking. One is, you know, there is, there is an experience, an unmediated experience of this natural world. And then there are the fantasies to which we've attached ourselves that obfuscate those living relationships. And our, the, the primary fantasy to which we've attached is identical to the fantasy of the mythological tyrant. So Joseph Campbell described the mythological tyrant as the man of self-achieved independence. And just play with that phrase, self-achieved independence. I mean, that sounds pretty good to us. You know, and isn't that the vision of that, you know, having that mansion up on the hill and, and your own bowling alley and your own swimming pool and, and independent from the world and, and you've got handlers who can keep the world at bay and there you are in your independence. And the terminus of that fantasy is represented by Howard Hughes who was in his day, I think, the wealthiest man in the world and had been a daring aviator and ended his life alone in a darkened room with only four people who were allowed to enter the room and everything he touched, he needed a Kleenex between him and that object because he was a germaphobe. You know, it's a, it's a descent. As, as you come out of relationship with the world, you descend into fantasy, the sort of fantasy that in isolation chambers, people experience. It's only relationship. We, we don't even exist without relationship. So it's not, it's not that there's a, it's not that there's a, a moment after practicing where you say, ah, I, you know, I finally got it. I'm finally whole. Uh, now let's see what's next on the agenda. It, it, never ends because life is continuous integration. I mean, with every breath, I am turning the exhalations of forests into me. And with every outbreath, I am going into the world perhaps to become fiber in trees or plants. Um, you know, I, I eat an apple and I bite and I chew and I swallow and its jukes and its flesh become my flesh and blood, becomes my capillaries, my eyelashes. And as I walk down the street, it is that energy that is moving me. I, you know, the, the human form isn't, you know, despite our desire to compare it to a machine, we're more like a whirlpool and the river of life comes into us and moves through us. And, and here we are, you know, a fairly stable form, just as a whirlpool is. But, but, but we, are, we are being transformed and sustained by the whole of the world in every moment. So in terms of how to get there, um, I mean, I come back to the breath. We are... Our, our reality, the reality of the body, it is 65% water or more. 65% water. We are fluid beings, and yet we consolidate our flesh with, with tension and, and, and habituated um, girding against the world. And the breath is the most fluid part of us. And you can feel the consolidations of the body almost like a sandcastle perched at the edge of the ocean. And the breath wave is like the ocean wave. And wherever the body doesn't feel fluid, you can just gently let the breath into it. And just as the rising tide will allow those waves to bit by bit soften the sandcastle and draw it back into the ocean. The breath, as it's allowed to permeate whatever in the body is not experienced as fluid, it will bit by bit come back to fluidity. And what you're doing is simply reclaiming your true nature. You're experiencing your body as it is, that's all. I'm 
going to open it up for questions in a second, Philip. And I'm imagining that there will be people um, listening that are familiar with your work and people that aren't. So we're going to get a whole range of questions. So I, I, I'm asking people, let me put me, myself on gallery view. Um, Raise your hand or put it on the chat if you feel more comfortable with that. But while, while you're kind of thinking of questions and raising your hands, could you just very quickly um, just say a little bit about the process that you've created then? And you do workshops on this. You're coming to Embercombe in November um, to teach as well. What would be the process that, how, how would you describe the process that you take people through? Well, I, I begin by saying it's not like anything you've likely encountered. Um, I mean, all the practices I've developed myself and, and it, the whole, the whole period is, is just play. It's just exploring it's, and it's, it's, you know, encountering within your being, those shadows that those consolidations, the patterns, and bringing them into awareness. And what I found is the moment you've become aware of what hitherto has been shrouded in neglect, it starts to change. You cannot bring something into the light without it responding and beginning to change. And so in the course of the weekend, people feel more spacious, more playful, more calm. I mean, the, the, the workshop moves through four themes and it begins with breath and especially, you know, the breath as it's experienced deep within the body in the pelvic bowl. And as the pelvic bowl awakens, you find you can come to rest there. And, you know, we think of the head as our home, but home is where you come to rest. You can't come to rest in the head. But you can drop your awareness, reverse that journey we've been making since the Neolithic and drop down and find your awareness resting there. And that's the second theme, rest. And then once you're at rest in the pelvic bowl, then you can receive the world. And here's, a, here's a, an important distinction for me, is we, we, we seek to be present. But if someone says to you, Rachel, just be present. You know, our cultural response is to, okay, give me a minute. I just need to organize myself. Um, hang on, hang on. And, you know, the very, the very impulse to organize your being will thwart your ability to be present because, because that experience of being present is one in which you feel yourself informed and touched by and shaped by the present you're being organized by the present so you need to be susceptible to that so that's what receptivity is about and the final part of the the two-day workshop um, is about integration and i think our culture knows nothing about integration we try to push ideas together and 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 construct them but that's not what integration is integration you know we orphan parts of ourselves and sometimes it's life-saving sometimes we would be overwhelmed if we allowed ourselves to feel the full import of it but then there comes a time when you can revisit that and give it your love and actively through the body invite it to integrate and that's what brings the the session to a close or the two-day workshop to a close Wow, thank you. I've got Ailsa um, with her hand up. Elsa, do you want to unmute and um, ask your question? <sighs> Hi, Elsa, are you there? Okay. Oh, could I could I respond to Robbie's question, just yeah. because he's he's pointed out that to draw your breath into the pelvic bowl is nonsense, literally, which it is. 
So uh, I, I'd really like to, to reframe that in a way that might be helpful. Yeah, the breath only goes into the lungs, but the body is fluid. And the breath, as it moves into the lungs, either, either there is a responsiveness to that down through the viscera, or they clench against it. And the, the pelvic floor, physiologically, is a diaphragm in the body. So there's the thoracic diaphragm and the pelvic floor. In our culture, the pelvic floor locks up against the breath. And so the, 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 the diaphragm above is going like this, trying to breathe, and this is unyielding. And when you release the pelvic floor to the breath, when it becomes a diaphragm that supports the breath, there is a massage through the viscera with every breath that is life-giving. So you're right. It's not that the breath goes into the pelvic floor, but my gosh, it feels like it does. Th thank you, Rachel. Uh, Angie, you had your hand up next. Would you like to go? I'm trying. Oh, there we go. I was trying to try and mute myself. Um, okay, cool. Um, great. Yeah, that wasn't my question, but I'd just like to add to that, that, yeah, and uh, I've studied anatomy and uh, definitely um if you breathe in your, your organs move it, it's just uh, a matter of physics and space um or, yeah. or they don't because there's so much tension there yeah okay yeah, yeah. Fair, fair enough yeah but they could move i mean you know oh yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 um but what i wanted to ask philip um i'm really excited because i'm coming to your workshop by the way so i'm really oh, looking forward. i'm looking forward to playing and uh and love emberkham and uh, what i wanted to ask is about uh nature i certainly find it's um really facilitates me to be in my body a lot more with with nature or and with with movement obviously so i guess that i mean it, it sort of goes without saying really doesn't it so but uh you know um yeah I guess that's just a uh, like yeah I don't really know what I'm asking there really I suppose when when you can't when when you haven't got that option I mean I know that we're part of nature anyway but you know in terms of like obviously having like being I if I'm in lots of surrounded by trees for example or that really facilitates me really helps yeah I mean I, f I find that we've been habituated to the paradigm that I'm in here and the world is out there. Yeah. So even in a forest, you know, I'm in here and, oh, look at that. Oh, look at that. Well, I mean, the forest will permeate our being, will change us. But when you can facilitate that, when you can invite that and feel the life of that forest in your body, it's a very different thing. Yeah. Thank you, Angie. Thank you. Batu, you are the next hand up. Are you able to unmute Cindy? Sorry, Fatu. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Brilliant. <laughs> Thank you so much. And um, sorry, it, it took time to unmute. Um, and, and thank you, Philip, um, for, for your presentation and for everyone who organized this. The reason I attending was to understand how you would maybe help um, with this problem of identifying ourselves with time. So I think when we say I, or when we say me, or I feel, or Rachel feels, or Fatu feels, there is an idea that Fatu is someone in time, or that Rachel is somebody in time. And that if you offer exercises or anything to do with knowledge, somehow you offer time. So you offer something that stays in time. And I, I'm not too sure how to phrase this, but I, my understanding is that our, our separation with what you call the present, which in a way would be the absence of time, is the fact that we identify ourselves with time. And it's not just a concept, it's also a feeling. We do feel what we felt when we were four years old. And we do feel what we anticipate feeling in a hundred years time. So there is something about 
the fact that we feel time that makes us believe that we are time that is an impediment to presence sorry i tried no no i mean let me respond i i i, I hope i'm clear enough in what you're saying to to offer something of use the the present contains everything that has passed before there are trace everything that has ever happened is still here in the present everything that is to come is potential in the present and so when i attune to wholeness <clears throat> I don't think of the present as time. I feel the present as place. I am located here as fully embodied as I can be and am informed by that with a subtlety that I remain incapable of fully taking advantage of. I feel this place. I am located here. So I, in, in that being located here, I am in the wholeness that is the present. I don't know if that is of any help, but that's how I experience it anyway. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you, Tati. Thank you, Philip. Lawrence, you are next. Lawrence. Do you have a question, Lawrence? I think you're uh, off mute now. Yes, Lord, you're asking me, uh, Rachel? Yes, yes, uh, yes. Oh, thank you. Sorry, I didn't hear it clearly. Um, yes, um, Philip, I do thank you so much for your presentation so far. It's been very thought provoking already. Um, one thing I found very intriguing was your statement when you said to be true to one's nature, you have to express your wildness. Now, some might find that quite alarming, like going into a wilderness of sorts. And I, I wonder if you could just elaborate a little bit on how you feel one might engage with that wildness and what would you look for in it? <laughs> yeah, I, you know, it's, it, we, we have domesticated ourselves. Yes. We have, we have made ourselves small. And I think one of the one of the reasons one of the uh, reasons for that, you know, wildness isn't safe, and we want to be safe. And I've I've learned, you know, in my decades on this earth, that life isn't safe. No, that's not the nature of life. You're going to get hurt. You're going to feel grief. You're going to feel loss. You're going to die. Life yeah. isn't safe. And I think we we internalize an understanding of that. And we draw the conclusion that, well, maybe if I'm less alive, I'll be more safe. Yes. <laughs> and, 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 and so our own wildness is understood um, as a danger. And, you know, if, you're, if, you, if you express yourself openly, you might be laughed at, you might be shunned, you might be ridiculed. And, and so we bottle it up and present ourselves in the way we hope um, will will show us up as we want to be seen. Yeah. And I, you know, to me, I, I jealously guard my right to look like an idiot. <laughs> um, I, I, I really do. Where would I be without that? Yes. Um, and and the wildness is the impulse of life itself as it moves through you and the wildness moves and you come back to peace and the wildness moves and there you are back yeah. at peace. And, you know, I, I mean, there are, there are realms within us that are dangerous to express. And then the, the issue is how to find a way to express those safely, you know, yeah. um, and, 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 make friends in a in a sense with our own wildness yeah and i also think you know we're, we're so fixated on tidiness 
and I, 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 let it be a mess. I mean, you, you go into a forest, it's the messiest thing you could imagine. There's yeah. everything strewn around, nothing's organized, life is a mess. And within that mess is the wildness, and within the wildness is this underlying calm, this peace with it all. Yeah. Thank you so much. That's, yeah, that's thank illuminating. You. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. <clears throat> I love that question, Lawrence. I wish I wish I'd asked it. <laughs> Ailsa, are you are you there? I'm going to come back to you to see if you are there and wanting to ask a question. Hello. Hello there. Brilliant. Yay. Hi. Hi. Yeah. What's your question? Um, I was wondering. So sometimes I, I yeah, I've experienced the the feeling the wind and the plants and there being like no barrier between me and everything else. And it's a very beautiful, peaceful, um, yeah, those are just words. I mean, it's, it's immense, but I also feel other people's emotions and it is a completely different feeling. I'm just wondering if you could explain that. Well, I can, I can speak to it perhaps and hope that there's something in that that's that's of use um the more sensitive you are the more crucial it is that you be grounded and i think you know i think of the lightning rod on a barn where this storm is raging and the lightning rod carries that energy safely to the earth sensitivity tends to be reactive if the if the retina didn't react to light, we wouldn't see. And that reactivity can only become coherent when we're grounded. And so, you know, we just happen to live in a culture that has um, denied and turned its back on the earth that seeks, I mean, my God, we're, we're still trying to raise our consciousness. It's up at the underside of our skulls and we're trying to raise it higher. No, no, come back to the earth. Find your place of rest on the earth. Lower your consciousness. And that, um, that quality of picking up on other people's emotions, when you ground yourself, your, your center is so clear and and you know things if things if you're harboring resistances in your body then energy comes through you and it gets stuck and so the emptiness feels a little dangerous because you can't control emptiness but i think the reality is that it's the control that can compromise us and when you're grounded you're at peace with that emptiness and and the world passes through you and you remain centered and clear within yourself thank you thank you yeah thank you elsa brilliant thanks elsa um we have questions in the chat that i'd love to get to and also sue but Philip, you have offered to give us a 10 minute um, exercise to finish off our hour. And I'm noticing it is 10 to. How did that happen? Oh, I know it's, it always does. And it's always a disaster. And please come, well, you are coming. I, I need, I, we've said already, but you are coming to Embercoom to do, what are we calling it? Rewilding through the body in November. So please, you know, it'd be lovely to see some of you there. But um, yes, Philip, we would love to get a little bit of a taster of your work if you are still up for that. Yeah, totally, totally. Um, and huge apologies to all to the questions we haven't got to. Um, I thoroughly recommend your books and your new book that is coming out also. Um, I'm sure that will give tips, for example, uh, being asked for in the chat here. So. But I will hand over to you, Philip, uh, to give you plenty of time to take us through something. Yeah, I, I'd love, you know, I've been talking about the spaciousness of being, the spaciousness of the body that allows the world to be felt there. So I'd love to do a little practice with you 
that begins to explore that. Um, you might find it helpful to stand for this if, if you're able to, if that's comfortable for you. And, and if not, you can do it sitting. And as you, as you settle, I would invite you to let go of any expectation, of any need to organize yourself. How does it feel to give up the organizing and just be with your breath? be with the weight of your body on the on the earth and just give give that a moment so that you're not in charge of it you are being carried by it by all those sensations of your being in this moment at rest in this place on the earth And I'd invite you to imagine that your body is like an hourglass. And it's, a, it's not an hourglass that, that is brittle. It's, it's, it's got some give to it, but there's that clear, clear outer layer of the body. And within it, there is sand, the way sand sits in an hourglass. And you feel the sand up from the soles of your feet through the ankles and the calves. You feel the weight of the sand in your thighs and up to the hips. You feel that sand filling the pelvic bowl and up through the body and at the same time up through the arms. And it's as though it's as though the fingertips, if they, if they touch your leg, for example, you can feel how the sand in the fingertips joins the sand in the legs and they are one. And you feel the weight of that sand up through the chest, up through the neck, up to the very top of your head. And just for a moment, feel that inert mass within you, that dry, granular, still weight, filling every part of you. And in the bottom of each foot, there's a little plug and the plugs fall away and the sand begins to rush out down through the bottoms of your feet and it empties, it rushes out. And in response, the sand above shifts and settles up through the legs, up through the pelvic bowl, up through the chest, through the arms, to the top of the head, and you feel the level of the sand slowly descending through the head as it shifts and settles through the body, and still you feel it pouring out, emptying through the bottoms of the feet, and the level of the sand begins to settle down close to the chest, it's just dropping through the top of the chest and all down through the bottom of the body, the sand is shifting and settling and pouring out through the soles of your feet. And the level of the sand makes its way down towards the belly and above the level of the dropping sand, there is just spaciousness. And still that inert mass is shifting and settling and pouring out through the bottoms of your feet and it settles down through the pelvic bowl and it begins to drop down through your legs and it's shifting and settling and emptying out down through the soles of your feet and it's dropping down eventually through the knees and it begins its journey down through the calves and it's pouring out through the bottoms of your feet and the level of the sand is dropping dropping down to the ankles down to the feet and finally the last grain of sand falls away. And just scan the emptiness of your body and notice if there are any little consolidations still there. And if there are, give those your permission to let go and fall down through the emptiness of your being and out through the soles of your feet. 
and just experience for a moment how much space there is within your body for the breath. There's nothing to get in its way. It can drift through every part of the body. It can swirl through the arms, through the head, down through the legs. And it swirls into the body and it swirls out of the body and every part of you is available to it. And take a moment to realize how much space there is within the body for all the sounds of the world around you to be felt. The sounds just pass into that emptiness and resonate there and you feel them. There's so much spaciousness to accommodate them. And appreciate how much space there is in your body for the present itself to live. And allow your awareness to dilate into the present and feel the present living within you, living through that spaciousness. And if you wish, allow your eyes to open if they're closed and discover how much space there is within your being for all the world to be seen and you feel within that spaciousness the colors, the shapes, the textures, perhaps the movement. And there is nothing between you and those sights. They are felt intimately within your being. And you might appreciate how intimately the world can be felt. And even as it's felt intimately, there's a non-personal quality to that. You don't take on any of it. You don't grasp at any of it. You don't take it personally. It just is and is felt within you and without you. And that spaciousness within the body is the spaciousness of your being. And you can return to it at any time. And that brings the practice to a formal close, but I would invite you not to just discard it. Don't feel you have to step out of it. Carry what portion of it you can forward with you. Philip, thank you so much for joining us. It's just been a profound pleasure. It, it makes me all the more excited to be coming. You've brought us some wild peace, I hope. Um, thank you, everybody else, for joining us tonight. Um, go well and safely onwards. There's people from all over the world in our group here, so sending much love. If everybody would like to uh, unmute, just to say goodbye, that'd be wonderful to hear some voices. Could I, could, I also, could I also just invite people, if they're curious, to visit my website, mm. which is embodiedpresent.com. And also to say that Philip is on tour in Europe uh, in November. So he's coming to the UK, Berlin, the Netherlands, and you're doing a facilitator 
their training course in the Netherlands. Yeah, in, starting in late November, just outside Amsterdam. Yeah. That sounds Thank wonderful. Yeah, I'm so looking forward. Lots of love. Thank you so much, Philip. Uh, see you soon. Lots of love to everyone else. And if you'd like to unmute, please do go ahead. Have a lovely evening, everybody. All the best. So good to be.